All right, good morning, everybody. All right, it's good to be with you today on this Memorial Day weekend. If you're going anywhere, please uh, drive the speed limit. I'm not saying that. I, I didn't get pulled over or anything, not this year, but uh, that I have been pulled over on Memorial Day weekend before, and it's, it's, uh, you can't say that you weren't warned. If you're driving anywhere, you'll pass five or six different uh, uh, state highway patrolmen uh, with lights on and, and, and getting, I was in Columbus yesterday, and we saw like six, I think, on the way there. On the way here? Mm -hmm. You got pulled over, Mamaw? Oh, yeah. I know how you've got a lead foot, so. Yes, sir. Is that what? There we go. We are going to uh, study Acts chapter 1, the first 14 verses today. And, I, and I, I, actually, I shouldn't say the word study because I don't think we're going to really dig in deeply today. I've got one thought that came from this um, this week as I... Uh, was looking over this section and just asking the Lord, what is it that you want me to say this Sunday? Um, what is it you want me to preach from this passage? And I've been trying to discern the best way to continue, you know, to, to keep doing the book of Acts study. Do we do it verse by verse, uh, you know, expositorily, or do we go uh, event by event? Do we go, uh, you know, thought by thought? And and, or do we take those major things that, that took place and, and, and just look at them that way? And I don't know that there's a, a right or wrong answer to how to do it, but um, I'm just going to seek the Lord and see what He gives from week to week, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll see what, where we go. But this week as I was studying, and, and maybe even the email that Ryan sent earlier about what he just described to you with the, uh, uh, the orphanage and the property, Maybe that had some influence on me in, in this, but um, I'm guessing that it was the Holy Spirit just saying, here is the simple thought or message that I want you to give to them this Sunday. And it's a thought for me, and it's a thought for you, it's a thought for uh, our brothers and sisters um, who are hoping to purchase property for an orphanage. It's a thought for all of us that I think that we can take in and be encouraged by today. And if it takes me five minutes to say it, I'll say it. If it takes me 30 minutes, then we'll go any, even longer. But I want to read this section of Scripture and pray, and then I'll, uh, I'll just tell you what it is, all right? And then we'll just talk about it a little bit. We've already looked at the first five or six verses, but I want to read those again. And I'm going to go ahead and read all the way through verse 14 here in the early pages of Acts. If you haven't been with us, we are studying uh, this, this book as just a, a, a follow-up to our study of the Gospel of John. And the author of the book of Acts is, is another writer of a gospel, and that is Luke. Luke is a physician who uh, came along and, and uh, became to believe in Jesus. We actually see Luke following along with uh, and doing some preaching with some of the other apostles in this book where he recalls uh, some of his work that he did as well. Um, and he is one who is writing to a particular man named Theophilus, and he's writing to Gentiles, and he's telling them this is what Jesus did and continued to do even after he was crucified and buried and rose from the dead, and he appeared back to his disciples again, and then he ascended back to heaven. And this is what he continued to do after he left. Well, I want to read this, this event of Jesus leaving the disciples to do the work, to continue doing the work that he started among them. And here it is. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the, son of, uh, Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the, with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Let's pray. Father, teach us from this word today, even if it's just one thing to take and to chew on and to be encouraged by. I pray that you would teach us and I pray that your Holy Spirit would do more than teach us. I pray that he would empower us in the same way that he empowered these early brothers of ours and sisters of ours in those days as they were waiting, waiting for your spirit to come waiting for your next move, waiting for your next word, waiting for you to give them the next instruction, waiting for whatever it was that you're going to do that they just trusted you. Teach us to do the same, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember hearing a, uh, a story um, about somebody telling an economist about the Apostle Peter's words um, in his epistle where he says, with the, the Lord, the Lord uh, for the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Um, and, and the economist heard this and he thought, well, that's, that's great. Then if it's true that for the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, is that, is that, does it work in everything? Like, you know, for, uh, you know, if we're, uh, can you break it down to the minute, you know, in the second, you know? It's like a minute, is a minute like a thousand years and is a thousand years like a minute? And uh, the Lord says to the economist, well, yeah, that's true as well. And the economist says, well, if it's true for time, is it true for money? Like, is a million dollars just like a penny to you and a penny like a million dollars? And the Lord says to the economist, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it is. And the economist says, well, Lord, can I have a penny? And the Lord says, sure, wait just a minute. <laughs> I had to tell that. I read that in a little email. It was relevant to what I'm about to say. As I read this, this section of Scripture in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and I said, Lord, what's happening here? What's, what's happening? I mean, we, we see your ascension. We see, you know, and that's, the ascension is not something that you hear a lot of sermons on. And I thought about developing an entire sermon around it, and I may still, I don't know. God so leads us to do that. But, you know, it, it's, it's kind of an odd thing. I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago. I think Bethany and I uh, were meeting and, and, and talking a little bit about uh, some of these these things in the scripture where it's, you know, you're, you're, when you share the word to somebody, when you share the story, the gospel message to somebody for the first time who has never considered Jesus or has never even heard about these stories before, it must sound a little bizarre. And, and for you to have to take on, for you to take on the role of the Holy Spirit, which means for you to take on his role, which is you feel like you have to persuade somebody to believe what you believe while you tell them, then it could be a little daunting in the task because as you're telling some of these stories, they sound like fairy tales. You mean a virgin was impregnated? How? Well, by God. And then God was, was you know, God sent his son, God, God who was actually God, who exists in three persons, but Jesus on earth was, was, was God, fully God and fully man, and then this Jesus lived a perfect life, and Jesus went and died on the cross, and then, oh yeah, then he rose from death, 
And then after he rose from death, he appeared to all of his disciples. So it's true that he met with, he, he did see them. They saw him. They believed that, you know, they knew this is the same guy that we'd followed around for three or four years. And, and then in the middle of them, he says, it's time for me to go. And he ascends to heaven. And these men, and this is not just some hallucination. They're not just looking on and imagining this. This is not just some parable that Jesus left them. This really happened. As they're standing there, Jesus, they watched Jesus ascend back to the place where he came from. They watched him ascend to heaven to sit on the, at the right hand of God. It's an amazing thing. And, 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 I, and I, I thought, well, that's what we're going to talk about here. But it actually wasn't that that drew my, the most of my attention this week. As, as, I, as I read this, I was struck by something that Jesus said in, in verse 6. Well, earlier, actually, in verse, uh, in verse 4. And then in verse 6, what the disciples ask him and then the way he answers them. In verse 4, it says, while they were staying, whilst, and whilst he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit uh, not many days from now. Now, we talked about that last week. And so you think, well, let's move on. But let's back up. What's, what's happening here? I mean, the disciples just have gone through some amazing experiences with Jesus. The disciples saw you know, Jesus arrested. And a couple of them watched him die. John, the writer of the gospel that we just studied, was at the foot of his cross while his mother was standing there as well. And Jesus spoke to John while he was dying. John saw that event. And then they were together as they were fishing and they were, they were, they were wor you know, worried after his death, after he had been buried and put into a tomb. They were wondering what's going to happen now. Is everything that we just experienced with him, was it just for naught? Was it just a three-year experience? Is that it? And then all of a sudden, the women come running back and saying to Peter and to John, hey, look, he's not in the tomb. He's, he, he's gone. Someone's stolen the body. And then on their way there, they see it for themselves. Jesus is not in the tomb. And then Jesus appears to them. And then he appears to them again on the shore as they have breakfast together. And then he appears to them again and he teaches them. And now they see and they know and they're reminded of all the things that Jesus taught them, all the things that they watched him do, all the things that they heard him say, all the people that they watched him interact with, those things were all starting to make sense. It was like puzzle pieces that Jesus had given them for the past three years. All of those puzzle pieces were starting to come together and the picture was starting to, to be able to be seen, the big picture of what Jesus had come to do in and among them. And now, as they're there, and Jesus has said, it, you know, he, they heard him say, it is finished on the cross, it is accomplished, what I have done for you, what I have come to do to pay the price for sin so that the world could be forgiven if they put their faith in me, you are now going to be entrusted with that message to take it out to the world. But you can't just do it by yourself. You're going to need a, a power, a promise that I've already given you, the promise from the Father, which will give you power. And what's he say to them about this? He says, wait, wait. That word struck me this week. You ever had to just wait? Have you ever prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God for something and, and believed that you were praying in the will of the Father, as Jesus says, believing that, that this is certain, this must certainly be God's will. And you don't see the answer, you don't hear the answer, and God looks at you, and God may, and maybe, maybe He doesn't say a word. <laughs> maybe He's silent. What are you doing in that moment? You're doing the same thing these apostles are doing in this moment, in these verses. I mean, what are they doing? I mean, we, I, would love to, I would love to give another message of some really great event here, you know? But they're told to wait. And they're standing there after they're told to wait, and they're watching as Jesus leaves. And then they, what, they go back to a, to, a, to a room up in a top of a building, and they sit together and they pray while they wait. But they're just waiting. No one likes to wait. I mean, we experience waiting, you know, I, 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 
I love going to amusement parks, but I don't like to wait in the lines. I love going on days when it's cold because no one else likes to go when it's cold. But when you go when it's cold, you just walk right on. Get on the roller coaster. You could ride the beast again and again and again. I like that. When you have to wait, it gets a little bit frustrating. And that's what happens. We wait in traffic. We wait in, in lines. We wait in, you know, if, you're, if you fly, you wait in holding patterns. You wait in grocery store lines. If you golf, you wait behind other people, you know, unless they say, go ahead and play through. You wait in a doctor's office. You wait for a spouse, perhaps. You wait for a baby. You wait for all kinds of things in life. You wait for a career. You wait for whatever. What is it you're waiting for? We, 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 have, we have to wait for lots of things. And waiting is not just something that you do to get what you want. As I thought and prayed on this word to this week, you know, just to try to do a little Lectio Divina where it's like, okay, God, if this, is, if this is a sermon around one word, what is it that you want me to say about this one word? And I think one of the things that, 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 that the Lord spoke to me is that waiting isn't just something that you do to wait for God to give you something that you want or wait. It's not just something that you do while you get what you want. There's a process. And waiting is the process, I think, of becoming what God wants us to be before you get what you want. Or before you get what you need, what he wants you to have. What God does in us while you wait is as important as what it is that you're waiting for. And I wonder if in however much time there was here when these disciples saw Jesus leave and from the time that you get to that from that point to chapter 2 when things really start picking up and the sermons really start getting exciting because you get to start talking about the the messages that Peter is preaching and Stephen's preaching and John and, and Andrew and these guys how they're talking to different people from different countries and different languages and you're seeing people come to know Christ from all over the place and you're seeing lots of amazing things take place I wonder what was happening in them during this time this time where it says wait just wait here wait here until I send my spirit and I give you the power that was promised waiting biblical waiting I don't think it's just a passive you know trying to buy some time you know playing around on your phone you know some solitaire or whatever I'm just waiting I'm just waiting waiting for the Lord just waiting 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 Biblical waiting is not just something that allows us to escape from our troubles. Waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. It's not a, you know, it's not a, just a resignation to, okay, I guess it's just, I guess I just, I just have to wait, just have to be bored. It's not a way to evade some kind of unpleasant reality that's coming. Those who wait are those who work. I mean, those who wait, you know that your work is not in vain. You know, it's like a farmer who waits. What's a farmer have to do? The part of the process is waiting. You plant seed, you plant, you work the field, you plant the seed, and then you wait for the plants to grow. You, and, and you wait on whatever assigned task is next. And God provides the meaning and the conclusions to their lives and the harvest to their work. Waiting is confidence. It's discipline. It's active. And it's sometimes painful clinging to God knowing that there will be a reward, knowing there will be a harvest. And when Jesus tells his disciples, wait in Jerusalem, he was telling them that this was a means of experiencing his peace, his power, his presence. And in their waiting, they would catch the, the wind of his spirit. They would see God move. We know it because we get to read the next page. We get to read the next chapter. But it requires tr trust. We have to trust the Lord. You know, sometimes we live by the adage, don't just stand there, do something. And sometimes I think I hear God saying, you know, don't just do something, stand there. It's a really important thing sometimes to just be able to wait, you know. Waiting means that we give God the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he's doing. Waiting means that it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's God's way, I think, of seeing if we're going to trust Him before we move forward with whatever it is that we believe we're supposed to do. You know? 
trust him that he, he really knows what he's doing and trust him before we go in, uh, before we keep going further it's a it's a patient trust trust is is patience whether whether it's uh, you know, it has to do with, with, with our relationships, whether it has to do with our finances, whether it has to do with our careers, our dreams, our, you know, our churches, whatever it has to do with, any kind of relationship that you're in, any kind of decision that you have to make, you, do you trust God that he knows what he's doing? I'm wondering if that's one of the lessons that these disciples had to learn before the Holy Spirit came. I know if I were them. I mean, I think about Peter, and sometimes I, I wonder if I'm not a little bit like Peter. When you look at the, the, the personality of Peter throughout the Gospels, one of the things you see about Peter is that every time Jesus said to do something or that he was going to do something, the first person to speak was Peter. I mean, Jesus is going around and he's, he's washing his disciples' feet in John chapter 13. He's washing his disciples' feet, getting them prepared for the Last Supper, um, and and. He's going around and he gets to Peter and Peter's like, you're not washing my feet. He's already, Peter's already made up his mind. You're not washing my feet. And then Jesus says, well, unless I wash your feet, you can have no part with me. Instead of, and instead of letting Jesus finish, Peter breaks right in. Okay, they're not just my feet, my hands, my head, everything else. And Jesus is like, no, a person who's clean doesn't need to have wash his whole body, but just his feet. And, and Peter is always jumping in. Now, I, I, I've got to wonder. If Peter already had it in his mind an idea of what was supposed to be done. I wonder, was it really important for Jesus to say, wait, to Peter? Wait, just wait. Wait for the promise of the Spirit. I mean, Peter probably thought, okay, we've learned a lot from Jesus. We've now seen him die. We've seen him resurrect. We've met with him for 40 days. He's taught us more. Now we're getting ready to see him leave. He's telling us that he's leaving us. So that must mean we're ready to go. Had Jesus not said, wait, I wonder if Peter would have seen Jesus go and say, all right, guys, let's get to work. And he starts right off on in his own power. And I wonder if that sermon would have had the same results as the one he actually preached after he waited. I got a sneaking suspicion that it wouldn't have because Peter would have done that in his flesh. I've preached before in my flesh, not by the Spirit, just something that I had studied and brought to you. And I get, there's a difference. There's a big difference between waiting for the Lord to give you the words and sometimes being scared because He hasn't yet given you those words until Saturday. And I wonder if Peter, it was important for him to hear Jesus say, wait, just wait. Because you'll know. When I come, you'll know. One thing that waiting does is it reminds us that God's in control. I'm reminded, I was reminded in, in preparing for this of the psalmist who writes about the watchman in Psalm 130. Because I, you know, people often want to know, well, what do I do while I'm waiting? What do I do? What do I do while I'm waiting? You know? And, and, and it's a good question. You know, during, during the times when we're waiting, we could take on the role of the watchman. Flip over to Psalm 130, and let's read these few verses here. It's uh, Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6. i got to give Josh something to do there. Now the pressure's on, you got to get it up there. Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> wait for Josh and trust that he's in control there. It's not a long chapter in the Psalms. It's not, it's not a long psalm. The, the, when you get into the, the 130s, those psalms tend to be pretty small, just a few verses long. Or a few stanzas, I guess. And this, this is a psalm about the watchman, this, uh, about what it means to wait for the Lord. And uh, let's just read the whole thing. Uh, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Okay, pray while you wait. That's what the apostles did. If you, O Lord, should mark the iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Now here are the verses that I want us to focus in on. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I hope. 
My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Lord, hope in the Lord. O, or, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For the, with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all iniquities. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. I wait for the Lord and I put my hope in His Word. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. The watchmen wait for the morning. Well, what are the watchmen doing? In biblical times, watchmen would sort of, they would stand and just vigilantly guard a city. And they would watch out for enemies who might attack them at night. And so he says, watchmen are waiting for the morning. And they would just watch. They would watch for enemies that would attack them during the night. And they would just wait for the sun to come up. And then they were, they were, while they were waiting during that night, they were alert. They were obedient. They were ready to respond when needed. When they called upon, when they were called upon to respond, they would spring into action. But on the other hand, they didn't make things happen. A watchman doesn't make something happen. They didn't control the rising of the sun. They waited for it. They didn't speed up the process of the, the dawn of a new day. The watchman knew the difference between his role and God's role. The watchman watched and waited. And when called upon, they would jump. But until then, they waited. They waited. And I think one of the things that waiting does, and probably one of the things that waiting did for Peter, and one of the things that maybe waiting does for you, is it, tell, it reminds us, hey, we're not in charge. But you can wait with confidence that there is someone who is in charge. It reminds us that, hey, we're not God. You know, we, we want to jump and fix things right now. If, if you're waiting on something to be fixed right now, if you're waiting on a problem to be resolved that, that is out of your control, but it's something that God can do, what, is, what do you immediately want to do? I know every man in here, because we, 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 we're fixers. We want to fix things, right? You want to fix problems. We want to fix relationships. You want to fix conflicts. You want to fix everything that there is to fix. And you want to control situations and people. It's just, it's just, a, it's just the way we're built. But trying to control people in situations and, and, and situations that are relationships that are out of our control is like trying to make the sun rise. That's not our job. We don't do that. It's out of our control. And we're right, we have to be reminded in those situations that we are not God. That's God's role. Our job is to be a watchman, to have the watchman's attitude. To have the watchman's heart, to wait in expectation for God to do what he said he will do. And Jesus tells his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Father, the power of the Spirit. He is coming to help you. And what waiting does, and I'll just kind of finish with this thought, is it, it allows God to do his work without us running off ahead of him and him having to rein us back in and running off in this direction and him having to bring us back over here. It just allows God to do his work. I mean, not only do we, we want to do God's work. I know, we, I know everyone here, you, you want, you really probably want to do God's work. And I do too. And sometimes God doesn't work fast enough, right? You know, when we came here to plant a church, 2001, and we had great ideas about that. August 2001, well, September 2001, September 11th to be exact, it put a little wrench in some of our plans and the way things went. So we've done a lot of waiting. And it's encouraging to me to see God just continue to work and to work and to work and to meet the needs of people in his way, in his time, to bring people to worship with us here in his way, in his time, and to see that he really does have things in control. And his timing is the best timing. In the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk was a prophet. He's one of those minor prophets that um, has a small, smaller book in the Old Testament this prophet was asking similar questions that some of us might ask during the time of waiting. Well, what do, we, what do we do while we're waiting? And how can we speed up the process? And 
what, what, you know, what happens during this waiting? You know, how can I become a better waiter, I guess? And he uses the same watchtower um, idea. And there's a dialogue here between this prophet, Habakkuk, and God in Habakkuk chapter 2, the first three verses. And using the same idea of the watchman and the watch post, listen to these words. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. <laughs> what do you do while you're waiting? If it seems slow, here's God's answer. <laughs> wait. Well, God, it's too slow. Wait. Wait for it. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God's working. You know what God's doing in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 or chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 and during that time after Jesus left his disciples and however much time was between the ascension and them sitting in the the upper room and praying, you know what God's doing? He's he's working. And you know that deep down he's working. I mean, deep down, somewhere, he's doing something, right? And you may not be able to see it. It may be hidden. It may be underneath. But it, deep down in your character, he's doing something. Deep down inside of you, in your person, who you are, while you wait as you're made to be patient, as you're made to just trust that God really is God. He really is in control. He really does know what he's doing. He really does have things in his hand. While you're doing that, he's doing something in you. So waiting isn't just passive. It's not just, just, just wasting time. He is working that entire time. He's doing something in you for that appointed time when he comes. Those who trust in the Lord, as Isaiah says, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. And there was a day, there was a time, it came when these disciples, the Spirit of the Lord came and they soared like eagles. And we're going to get there. I love this next chapter. But before they could get to that next chapter, they had to wait. And that's the place where the disciples are in that minute. There may be a place where you're at right now. In Acts 1, 6 through 8, the disciples asked Jesus a, a question. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed for his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses and all the places that he lists. And in that, in that verse, there was a, a question that the, there was something the disciples wanted to know while they were waiting, right? Well, okay, if you're going to make us wait here, at least tell us this. And what's Jesus' answer even to their question? I'll let you know what you need to know. It's not for you to know. <laughs> I mean, they're being told, they're being taught more and more and more what it means to just trust that God is working. I'll conclude with this. I read a story this week. Um, I was reading about, you know, I was trying to find some clever way of talking about waiting and what God does when you don't see him. I thought, well, you know, there's probably stories out there about planting trees and things like that and how long it takes a tree to grow, you know, and, and uh, sometimes we want to be more like mushrooms. Mushroom can grow overnight, you know, but an oak tree will not take forever. And, and uh, do you want to be a mushroom or an oak tree? You got all those kinds of little things. And then I came across this story about the Chinese bamboo tree. Any of you guys, any of you know how this thing grows? It's a really, really amazing thing. It, it's one of the most remarkable plants on all the earth. Uh, when a gardener goes out and plants the, the seed for the bamboo tree, the Chinese bamboo tree, he's not going to see anything but a single shoot coming out of the bulb 
for five full years. And that's just a tiny little, tiny little shoot that has to have daily food and daily water and during all the time that the, the gardener is caring for this, this plant that's supposed to grow into a big tree, it's only going to grow less than an inch. <laughs> well, at the end of the five years, five years, at the end of the five years, this Chinese bamboo does something amazing. It will grow 90 feet tall in 90 days. Now ask yourself this question. All right? I thought that's an amazing, that's an amazing, you know, natural thing that takes place. As I thought about this, I, I asked myself, okay, when did that tree actually grow? In those 90 days or in those five years? When did the tree actually grow? And I think the answer to that question is in all of the unseen parts of the tree. I mean, what we see is what's outside the ground. But if you were to go under the ground and see the root system of, that was developing during those first five years when you only had less than an inch of a little bamboo tree and you saw the root system and the, how deep they spread into the earth preparing to support this 90 foot high shoot that would come out of the ground, that's when it was growing. Now, people didn't see that. I mean, you, you don't see that. It's not an amazing thing. It's not a glorious thing. You're not accomplishing much that can be seen. God's accomplishing something in you while you wait. Trust Him. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning with expectant hearts, I know, wanting You to do what we believe that you've promised to do in our lives, wanting you to do what you promised to do in our church, wanting you to do what you promised to do in our families, in our jobs, in all areas of life, whatever it is that everyone in this room this morning has been waiting for, my prayer is that they would trust and know that you are God, that you're in control, and you're working. Even though we can't see it, even though we wonder, even though we doubt, doubting's okay, but just cling back to you and trust that in our waiting, it's something that you have actually told us to do. I'm so thankful that you told those disciples to wait because there have been so many times in my life, Lord, where it seems like I've had to wait and I've wondered, is this really necessary? Thank you that in the first chapter of Acts we see that before an amazing event took place that those disciples got to take part in, they were told by Jesus, just wait. Just wait. Mm. Grow us while we wait, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.